speaker for the day, Laura Burnside. Laura, for over 20 years, has led hospital leaders and physicians through culture change, resulting in the highest levels of engagement, service, and operational excellence. Laura is currently the SVP, Chief Patient Experience and Strategy Officer at JPS Health Network in Fort Worth, Texas. Prior to joining JPS, Laura spent 10 years working as a coach for a large healthcare consulting firm. She's worked with thousands of hospital leaders and physicians at over 150 organizations, which included small rural hospitals, large for-profit and not-for-profit healthcare systems, and academic medical centers. Her concentration on building and sustaining a culture of excellence has led to organizations achieving their highest outcomes. It's amazing. I'm really excited to hear. Um, you also have an author of a book titled Believe in the Journey of Your Dreams. Laura, we are so excited to have you here. If you want, you can turn on your video and join me on the stage, and we can kick off this session, kick off uh, this wonderful session titled Caring for Our Caregivers. So with that, Laura, you have the stage. The floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Andy, and I'm honored to be here today with you. We um, do have so much that we need to do in healthcare today and so many priorities that hit our plate and strategies that we're putting in place that are different than what we did pre-pandemic and so many things that are taking our time and really just helping us get focused on, on what is most important and why we went into healthcare in the first place, which is our patients. But at the same time, there are all these people who have been through probably the hardest time of their lives, personally and now also professionally. And as we thought about this, and as we began working through this very, very difficult time for our caregivers, we began to beef things up because at the end of the day, we can only do all of those things that we need to for our patients if our people are in a really good space. So today, I'll be sharing some of what we did here at JPS. I am happy to answer any questions that come up. And um, hopefully at the end of the day, we, uh, we all walk away with something that we learn and can do better for those who are caring for our patients each and every day. And um, we all have the honor and privilege of working with them. So we want them to be the best that they can be. So with that being said, we'll hop right in. And we, let's see here, Andy, this worked for me before. For some reason, my slides are not moving. So we'll. So uh, if you click on them, I can see your cursor. Uh, if you want to click yep. on the cursor. Okay, there we go. There we go. Now they're working. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. No worries. Um, I would be remiss, though, if we didn't start with uh, kind of the foundation of who we are at JPS. We have what we call rules of the road here, and there are three rules that help direct and guide all of the work that we do for each other here at the hospital and within our clinics, and also um, for our patients, of course, which are the reason why we're here. So these three rules help us to provide that patient or human-centered care so that we can do all that we need to do for our community. We are the public hospital for Tarrant County, Texas, which is in Fort Worth. So our job is to make sure that we serve all and that we do that with excellence. So we follow these three rules every single day. Own it, seek joy, and don't be a jerk. And, and under each of those rules, we do have specific behaviors that we review every single month with our entire team here so that we're always encouraged to do what's right for each other and for our patients. So I'll take you through each of these three rules today and how we embedded them in caring for our caregivers. As you look at own it, the behaviors that we identify with that rule are respect, responsibility, engaged, and accountable. And so as we thought about this, we began to really look at what our first phase of the pandemic was. And that was really this disoriented stage. Everyone didn't, you know, we all came to work and we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was getting ready to happen. We didn't know if it was safe. Was it not safe? Who should be here? Who shouldn't be here? How did we get people at home? Everything was just disrupted. And I remember so vividly, like it was yesterday, sitting in a room with all of our leadership team, having this discussion about the fact that we were going home or that we were going to stop all of our group meetings, that everyone had to wear a mask, that you know we were trying to do everything that we could to keep our team members safe. And it was very disorienting. Up to that point, we did not have any remote workers. And within a week's time frame, like many of you, 
we uh, sent a number of people home. We, we sent about 1,500 people home instantly. And then um, anyone who had direct bedside work that they needed to do stayed at the hospital. And so that in itself was very disorienting. We had built a very highly engaged workforce and had performed in the top decile across the country for many years. And now all of a sudden we're not seeing each other. And so we you know, got very disoriented through there. But when, you, when we um, thought about this, we decided to form a care for the caregiver team. And that, that consists of four directors here at the hospital. One is our um, executive director over our behavioral health unit. One is our executive director over spiritual care and ethics. One is our director over our employee assistance program. And one is the director of integrated well-being that works in our um, residency program. And those four individuals are highly connected to the work that we do here at the hospital, and they're highly connected to our employees. And so we decided to pull them together to build a framework for us. And what I will share with you today is the result of that work. These are amazing individuals who came together for the good of the cause, and they did it very quickly when they were also disrupted and disoriented. So they decided to take a, a very simplistic approach so that we could implement tactics and strategies into that approach to be able to serve the, in the best way we could. So phase one was this, this disorientation phase. It's this immediate, very quick, it's generally short term, um, this one was a little bit longer, I think, than what we had um, originally thought, but it was, it was a, everything was just disrupted. It was this event that happened. It was shocking. There was a ton of distress that came from it. Um, resources that we had used typically were no longer available to us, and things became very different very quickly. And so they, as, they used this phase as kind of addressing just the basic just the basic needs, just like Maslow's heart, uh, hierarchy of events, this is our foundation. Disorientation happens, what do we do? And so what we, what we did at that point was we began deploying resources to all different areas from particularly our chaplain group. And we began just deploying them all over the hospital as quickly as we could to just do a quick assessment of what was going on, just kind of get the feel of it so that we could then begin to build interventions, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The second phase for this uh, framework that they built is orientation. And the orientation phase is, okay, this has happened. Now here we are in the middle of it. We've responded and we are responding to where we are right now. There's um, some forward energy that comes from this. We began doing some things a little differently and very consistently and intentionally so that our uh, team here at the hospital could actually feel the presence, even though there were so many people who were not here, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. So this is where we began to really help people adjust. We've had the shock of what happened. Now we're adjusting to where we are right now and what do we need to do in order to serve in the best way that we can. So we began to provide encouragement, tools to help sustain momentum and positive reinforcement methods in order to be able to bring our team to a, a more normal place, if, if you can call it that. And then what happens is this third phase, which is this reorientation into whatever the new norm is and whatever that might look like. At, um, and, and now it looks different than it did even before. But it's where your system starts to sort of level out. Things become not so disruptive every single day. There is a much more normal um, environment that you're building. And so it's, it kind of is our new operating system, if you can imagine that. So there's a lot of support as everyone begins to really adapt to finding new ways that we move forward together, new ways of uh, working through grief, new ways of working through that um, feeling of change, which is always in itself uncomfortable for people. And then we just start to kind of think about like, what does this all mean? And, and because as humans, we want to wrap our head around what, you know, what is the meaning of all of this and what purpose did it serve? And so we began looking at that. Now, the beauty of these three phases is that you can move back and forth and they're very, very fluid. 
So as we would go into the beginning of the pandemic, we worked at the, at the very, you know, crisis has disrupted, phase one was enacted, we very quickly got into kind of a new normal period, and we began really working through tools, tactics, strategies that fit within that part of the framework. But then what happened? Another surge. And where we had tired coworkers, we had a ton of adrenaline at the beginning, and now all of a sudden we have very tired people who are now wondering, what does this mean? Is this going to be the same as what it was before? Are we going to have the major amount of death that we had at the beginning of all of this? I don't know that I can go through that. And so we began deploying these phases and differently, mind you, in different areas of the hospital because as the assessment took place, you could determine where people were and what, um, what their needs were. And so we began really working in that vein. That being said, um, five surges later, here we are. We've learned a lot. We've addressed a lot. We've grown a lot. We've changed a lot. There's nothing the same today as prior to the pandemic. Not the way that we interact with one another, the way that we serve one another, the way that we speak, the meetings that we have, everything is different. Who would have even thought that we would be having a conference like this virtually and connect people all around the world? Who would have thought that we would not have family members at the bedside of their loved ones and that our care team or our chaplains here at this hospital oftentimes are sitting with patients, FaceTiming with their families, um, working through all kinds of Zoom meetings so that we can have family meetings virtually across this world. We serve a very diverse population at JPS. In fact, we interpret for about 220 languages here. So we have people who come from all over the world and we were actually able to connect with them because of technology that was created because of the pandemic. So there are some good things that have come from this and allowed us to best serve our patients and better serve our patients because of the way that we grew and what we did to change but there's also been a lot of heartache and distress that's come from it. And so we'll talk through a few of those things um, as we continue, but I just want you to be thinking about, you know, as the pandemic happened, what did you do within your organization? Because my guess is you worked through these th same types of phases too, whether you had them down on paper or not. My, my gut tells me that because we do what's right for our caregivers all the time, this is just something that would intuitively come to healthcare workers in, you know, through any crisis. So those are the phases. There is a six step process that we go through. So step one is really doing an assessment of needs and hopes. And this is really important and we use these words quite intentionally. There's one side of it that is, I absolutely need this in order to be able to continue. And then there's this other side of the emotional hope that's there that became so strong through the pandemic for our care teams. The, the crying in the parking lot before we went home um, from work and then wondering, should I go home from work? And not really having a good answer to any of these questions has led us to a place that is very different today, again, than what we've dealt with in the past. And so we really wanted to get into what are the needs and the hopes of our team members so that our interventions were appropriately deployed in the right areas at the right time. Then we started to assess what resources we had. Sometimes we couldn't get supplies. Sometimes we couldn't get the materials that we needed. And so what could we do to kind of makeshift things? Like for instance, one of the um, things that we did during this step, step was we used to do something called Soul Cafe and we still do it today, but it, during the pandemic, we had to quit it. And it's a, a coffee cart that we take around the hospital and we do it for areas that are struggling particularly. So it creates this space where people can gather and they can talk about, you know, whatever they want to talk about. It's just being around a coffee cart, having some, some time to be together. But we couldn't do that although in the same way that we did before. So what did we do? We created little packets and in the packets were little coffee pods and 
coffee cups and a little piece of chocolate put in there. And then we did a um, dousing of cotton swabs in different essential oils, and we called it essential oils for essential workers. And they could put that cotton swab inside their mask, and so it was lavender or another calming scent that would just help them know that you know it's going to be okay we're, we're in it together and we because we couldn't take the cart around because we didn't want those kind of gatherings we brought supplies up to the units or to the clinics and we began just distributing them um, in in a different way and so as we um, went started going through this and the assessment phase happened we began again determining how could we deploy resources in the best way and then we looked at, you know, what was the desired outcome we were looking for? What might that best intervention be? Something simple even as um, what I just talked about. And then we began offering the intervention and measuring results. So our most recent numbers for our EAP sessions in 2021, we hit um, 1,200, which was a, um, a, a, a lot, a 1,200 a week, I should say, a lot. 54% of those were for mental health related situations. And that was new for us here. That was a large percentage. And then additionally, we started tracking how many interventions were we doing for our employees and just caring for our care team. And that was about 2,500 a week. And we're still doing quite a few, although not quite that high. We have still continued the same full court press that we had going on during the pandemic to make sure that we're serving in the best way we can. So some of the interventions that um, we pulled together, some we were doing, but we changed them based on need, again, based on that assessment and what were the needs and the hopes. Um, we built things like Stronger Together, which was a peer support program that we put um, together here at the hospital so that we could make sure that peers were supporting peers and then we would support those groups as well through our um, interventional process. Schwartz rounds was something that we had here at the hospital for the last several years, about six years or so, but we began doing those monthly and uh, instead of quarterly. So people could, in, um, they were virtual, they could sign in, they could participate in these in um, any way they could. And we began making these um, very COVID centric so that we started processing through what we were hearing from those assessments through our Schwartz rounds. And if you're not familiar with that um, program, the Schwartz Center is a, an organization that works with hundreds of hospitals around the country and around the world. And you pull a, a panel together to discuss typically a case that's occurred. And normally you don't um, touch base on things that are currently happening because the emotions are too strong. But this was such a different scenario and different situation that we really wanted to work through the grieving process that was happening through COVID. Um, you know, so much loss that was occurring and be able to help people process together. And these became highly effective for us. And so for about two years, we did these on a monthly basis for our team members. And we had several hundred people dial in to participate in those sessions every single month. Additionally, we realized our leaders needed different resources. So uh, we began bi-monthly leader enrichment groups. And this was volunta voluntary, all of this was. Um, but our, our leaders could log in to, again, a virtual learning session, and there were specific leadership topics that were covered that related to dealing with and supporting people and leading through a pandemic. And so we did those on, a, um, on an every other month basis. And then we also did healing conversations which was just an, another open forum. There was a topic that was related to what we were hearing from those assessments. And so in real time, our employees were able to participate and learn and grow and develop together on the thing that was bothering them or the thing that they needed the most. And so those topics varied and changed and switched. And I can't say enough about our Care for the Caregiver team who spent hours and hours and countless moments trying to make sure that we hit the mark on those. And again, we had several hundred people who would participate in those as well. When the pandemic first started, we were trying to do something really fast and uh, hopefully impactful. And so we created an, an extension with a voicemail on it. And every day 
our Care for the Caregiver team created a mindful minute. And so there was a topic of strength, courage, admiration, appreciation, gratitude, um, any of those things that um, we felt would be whoops, popular uh, messages for our team to hear. And so um, those were created every single day and they were no longer than a minute and you could call into it at your convenience so that you could get the inspirational message that you might need to hear that day at that time. We did a lot of um, education, psychoeducational uh, training. We had our hope tree, which I'll show you in a moment. We began something called Love Bombs, which was um, a song and we went down and rewrote the song so that the words were appropriate for that area. And we began to bring um, snacks or coffee. Again, we couldn't stay very long, but we were able to do that for our team members so that they could feel appreciated and valued. Uh, Soul Cafe, as I already mentioned, that coffee cart that we brought around. And then we did on demand, you can call anytime and we will debrief and emotionally process with individuals or with team members. And then we began a memorial service that we still do on a quarterly basis to honor and any of our employees who were lost or their loved ones who were lost either from the pandemic or from other um, illnesses and or other situations. And so we provided that. And we also created a grief support team that uh, works directly with our human resources department for any of our employees that are um, unfortunately not no longer with us due to um, due to death. And so we began working through those things to try to be as intentional and thoughtful as we could on what the needs might be of our, our employees. This was the outcome of a request that we had from our employee base, and that was to create a prayer garden. We, as I mentioned, we have an incredibly diverse group of employees here and patients that we serve. And so we wanted to be able to provide a space that was um, non-denominational, but it was very serene. And that there was a place on campus that you could find peace. And so there are little rocks that are here and you can write the names of your loved ones on the rocks and leave it in the riverbed. And this, this prayer garden has become a space where I'll see people oftentimes just sitting on the little benches that you see here and just taking a moment to uh, find a place of peace and serenity before they go back in and continue to serve as we do in, in all of our hospitals these days. This was a hope tree. And we decided because we were assessing needs and hopes and there were so many things that were coming out of the work that our, um, that our care for the caregiver team was doing. And they were hearing so many words of hope and things that people were, were just really wanting to see happen. And we thought, well, let's materialize that. So we, we had a, a, a tree that we had used for something else here at the hospital. And we repurposed it by putting fairy lights on it. And so it lights up. And we created these little cards out of um, linen paper so they feel really good to your touch. And the Hope Tree uh, actually made its way around the hospital and throughout our network so that we could capture the hopes and dreams of what our team was wanting at that time. So you can see, you know, we I hope we, we've all already had asymptomatic COVID and we're now immune. Um, you know, the health of family and coworkers was important. And, you know, just always, and people saying over and over again how grateful they were for their employment. Through the pandemic, we did not lay anyone off. And so we ended up, um, you know, redeploying them to different areas throughout the hospital. And, and they were grateful for that. And we were grateful for that. We needed resources like we'd never seen before and in areas that we'd never seen. Screening, for instance, you know, we had to stand screening up right away. And so our redeployed employees were able to go uh, to go there. And you can see on the tree just how grateful they are for their employment here. But this tree made its way throughout the network. And we read every one of the hopes and dreams that people were sharing it made its way into the chapel and we prayed over the tree and then we brought it to the the hallway that entered our covid unit and we had this tree where people could read the hopes and dreams of our co-workers they could continue to add to this tree but it was the last thing that they saw before they went in to serve in that unit 
And the feedback that we got from that was absolutely incredible. It allowed them to know that they weren't alone. And I think that was such a, a huge feeling for all of us during the pandemic was, you know, I'm just alone in this whole thing. Quarantining was hard, not being able to be with our families and, and our friends in the same way that we had been before. And so this allowed that support to be felt and read and be a real source for our care team as they walked into that unit. And then it's now made its way to different areas throughout the hospital. And we continue to use it as a source of us collecting hopes and dreams and needs of our care team. So then we get to seek joy, which is our second rule. And we, uh, we consider that to be behaviorally when we serve, when we're grateful, when we celebrate others, when we're supportive of one another. And there were so many things that happened during the pandemic that we just had never experienced. And so support looked really different than what it had looked like before. So as we began to give vaccine and as we began to get our community members involved in that and you know, as controversial as it was, we were trying so hard to be able to save as many lives as we could. And so we began to celebrate our vaccine. And we had a vaccine clinic just outside of my office and it was constantly busy. And every single time I walked by there, all I could hear in, in my mind was this ABBA song, you know, of um, dancing queen. And so uh, we became the vaccine queen group and we made our debut one morning and uh, celebrated our um, vaccines and how many we had given when we hit the 50,000 mark. So we were so excited, but this is a group of our executives and I may or may not be in that picture, um, but this is a group of us who came out to just really celebrate and, and uh, hopefully get some, some joy. So um, that was a lot of fun. On the right-hand side, what you see is a thank you card. And we're very big on giving thanks and appreciation to our team members here. But we decided to have a thank you week. And so last spring, during hospital week, we gave out over 20,000 thank you cards that looked just like this. And they were, um, our team members were asked to send them to whoever it was that they appreciated for whatever it was that they had done. And so this is a sample of a thank you card that came out. And we got so much traction from that and so much appreciation for the intentionality behind gratitude that um, we were asked to do it again. So um, this year we're, we're in hospital week right now and we are um, doing all kinds of celebrations and thank yous, but our thank you notes are a part of that process as well. And I think there's nothing more that people appreciate than just to be thanked. Then we move to our third rule, which is don't be a jerk. And we consider that um, when we are caring and considerate and empathetic and compassionate for each other. And so we, we don't allow jerks here at the hospital. But, um, but now we're in this different concept. And as happy as everything was that I just shared, the reality is that this is what we're experiencing right now. And our care teams are experiencing moral distress in high, high levels. Regardless of where you are, this is, this is where we are as a healthcare um, community. And so we define this as occurring when you really don't know what the correct action is ethically, and you feel powerless to really take that action. So an example of that was in, on, on its very most simple terms would be, um, oh, through the pandemic, I was asked to come to a family wedding. Well, I didn't know what that meant. Was it gonna be a COVID spreader? Was my family gonna end up being like so many that I read about and heard about where they went to an event, a birthday party, the birth of, uh, celebrating the birth of a baby, a wedding, um, any kind of, of event that, that was held for families. And was my family gonna end up being one that everyone contracted COVID and everyone was sick and maybe even died? And so there's this real anxiety that came with that. And so I didn't feel like there was really a good answer. The answer that, that I had to choose was, do I go and take that risk or do I not go and I miss something that's really important to my family? And again, that's a very simple example of this, but these decisions are what are being made every single day, every single moment within our care systems. 
what decision do you make? What do you do? And on top of an already tired, exhausted, and worn out team, this is debilitating and can be debilitating. So our efforts to do everything that I've just described have beefed up even higher because we know that right now it's more important than ever. And leadership is more important than ever. So part of, you know, as, I, as I've kind of been working through this, I've been thinking about what's required of leadership today versus in 2019, because that doesn't look anything the same to, in my mind. So the things that I think are going to be really, really important is for us to really think about what defines a leader during times of crisis? What does a leader do in those moments of crisis that are, are really those defining moments for our team members so they know that they can trust us? And what types of things do we need to continue doing every single day so that we can lead into the future? And these questions I pose to my leaders all the time. And we've thought through this and worked through this. And here's what we've come up with that we think leadership in the future means. Number one, empathy. Having empathy and being empathetic has always been important, but it's more important now than it's ever been. Vulnerability. Being vulnerable enough to say, I'm scared too. I don't know all the answers, but together we can work through it. Compassion, understanding that people are going through one of the hardest times of their lives and being compassionate about that and having compassion in every moment, even when we're tired as leaders for what our team members are going through and understanding what we need to do in order to help them with whatever their situation is. Integrity, honesty has never been more important than it is now. We have got to stand up for what's right and our teams need to know it. And that is critical and, and a valuable, valuable skill for the future. In addition to grit, I don't know about you, but my grit has become so strong this year, it's crazy. I never thought that we could do the things that we did and yet we did them and we did them with excellence. And we need to be proud of that, but it's not over yet. So our grit needs to be stronger than ever. And our flexibility. Our employees are demanding us to be flexible and adaptable. And the more that we can do that as leaders, the better that this will be for our um, healthcare community as a whole. Because right now what's happening is we've got some doing this and some doing this, and we're kind of stealing employees from each other. And the reality is we need to be really creating the environment that works for the people who are in our workforce today. And the last thing that I will say on leadership is that we really have to love our own. And I use that word in a very intentional way, even though I know it's strong. I, I know it's a strong word. I uh, believe it's a strong word, but I believe it's the right word. And if we love our team members and we truly care about them, they feel it. And I just heard employees this morning talking about their leader and how much they love him and how loyal they are to them. And that's our reality is that people still today, through all the research that we've done all the years, they still stay at work and work for a person that they admire and they trust. And when leaders love their own, that's what gets developed. So I hope this was helpful. Um, just kind of walking through this journey makes me feel proud of the work that we did. We worked very hard to take care of the employees that we had here in every way we could, whether it was physically or emotionally. And so I'm happy to take questions from any of you. Um, I'd love to be able to learn. So here's my contact information. And if you have things that you would like to share, I would love to hear from you. So don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I will close and open for any questions. Well, thank you so much, Lara, for sharing. Um, you did some truly incredible things for the nurses and clinical staff at your hospital. Um, my wife's a nurse, so COVID was uh, definitely a bright spot and a terribly dark spot for her. She she felt like she was very useful to patients, but she also mm -hmm. felt like she wasn't valued by everybody as a nurse. Um, yes. Definitely wasn't uh, wasn't a good time. I, one of a, one of the innovative thought leaders um, 
I, I have read, it says that, you know, a environmental catastrophe, like an earthquake, like brings people together, but a global pandemic makes everybody an enemy. So uh, it's, it's cool to see you really, really putting an effort to make love and acceptance and, and, and support uh, yeah. very uh, normal across a hospital system. Yeah. Um, we have a few questions here. Uh, okay. I have a question though, actually, just just going off of this. So, was your job focused on this before COVID, or was COVID was this yeah. something that specifically was brought about because of the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. We um, unfortunately had had a terrible crisis here at the hospital the year prior to COVID. So we've been in three years of very difficult time here. And when that initial crisis happened, we uh, we actually had a nurse who came on site and was injured very badly. And as a leader, you would never, you never ever want someone coming onto onto your campus and not leaving um, at the end of their shift. And um, so at that time, we began deploying pieces and parts of this, although very loose and not well defined at all. Um, but, but we knew what worked during those initial times and we knew what didn't work. And so my challenge to the Care for the Caregiver team was to really start to put some solid foundational elements around this and to build a framework so that regardless of whatever the crisis is, because and I say that intentionally, because today we're dealing with COVID, but tomorrow it'll be a different crisis that comes yeah. in. And so we need to be prepared for that. And so the team rallied together very quickly to say, okay, here's what we've been doing the last 12 months, but here's how it can deploy and be utilized regardless of whatever crisis we're in. Mm, amazing. Um, and and the, you utilize several strategies, several um, uh, <clears throat> Um, strategic processes to help support nurses. Now, how did did you just did you have a, a big brainstorm session? Did you yeah. implement some type of innovative methodology? How did you get inspired to do those? Because you had a list of at least like eight or nine, um, like Soul Cafe and the Schwartz method. So how did you yeah. learn to do that for nurses and clinicians? Well, first of all, through the assessments, we really wanted to determine what was valuable for them. And through those ideas or things that, you know, these listening sessions brought to light, we then pulled the care for the caregiver team back together. And yes, we spent hours and hours and hours of brainstorming, developing, creating, and then deploying. We knew that we had to do some things really fast. So we did the mindful minute line and we also did a prayer line, again, non-denominational but we did the prayer line at noon and at midnight every day and you could log in from wherever you wanted. So they were, it was easy, right? We had an extension that was created. It was a voicemail for the mindful, mindful minute. And that was just the voicemail message. So you could leave a message if you wanted additional support or resources. And so then we would deploy either our EAP team or our chaplain team uh, for those individuals that requested that. And sometimes we would get departments that would request it. And so as we began um, hearing and listening and really understanding what those needs were, we, we changed things and, and addressed things and adjusted as we needed to. The list that you saw is a very small sample of everything that we did, but it was um, that through those listening sessions that we began to really sit together in a room, brainstorm, um, really figure out what can we do quickly and then what would be longer term. and we already had Schwartz rounds in place, so that was an easy one for us. Um, and then, like I said, just those two quick little hits of the mindful minute and the prayer line, those we did like in the first few hours because they were right. just easy. I think that's brilliant in, in um, identifying what can we do now, what can we do later, and what can we do very yeah. much later. I think that's yeah. th that, the, the innovative things, uh, innovative uh, programs I've been involved in. Um, sometimes when they focus on too much, too far away, mm -hmm. They lose that energy. Yeah. So I love how you were like, what can we do today? What can we do yeah. within the next few hours? Uh, great idea. Um, what do you think is, like, what do you think is next? You, we, the COVID's here, right? So COVID happened and we're somewhat, some say we're coming down, some say it's not going anywhere. Do you mm -hmm. think that there's going to be another disruption to that level? And if so, do you think that the healthcare system is in a footing where it could prepare for that? Yes, 
uh, yes, yes, and yes is what <laughs> I think. Um, you know, I'm I'm the person who, <laughs> when I was in my undergrad and also in my master's program, and we had to learn about global plant pandemics, I thought oh, it's never going to happen. Let's just get through this, right? Um, and now here we are. So lesson to everybody, when you're in a class and they're talking about something that you think can never, ever happen, it can, <laughs> and we should listen so that we, we are appropriately serving when it does. Oh, man, um, that's funny. <laughs> I think what happened, though, was we, we began, um, again, just in this stunned phase, almost, like, where are we? What's happened? The only thing that we knew here in Texas was what we saw happening in New York. and um, which was so tragic, right? And around the world. And so I think we've gotten smarter with the way that we treat things um, and certainly the way we treat this, this illness. But I also think what we learned was that we can actually pivot pretty quickly. And healthcare in general has been a pretty slow moving industry mm -hmm. and we couldn't do that. So we had to implement things like telehealth really fast, which again, we didn't have. We had to transition our patients over to that because we wanted to still see them and serve and meet their needs, but we couldn't do that in person. And so our CEO a couple of uh, weeks ago sat us down as an executive team and said, I just want to be clear on where we are because we moved and did things so quickly and excellently at the beginning of the pandemic and momentum doesn't slow just because we tend to be coming out. And so her um, charge to us was to make sure that we're still innovating and creating and working together in that same way so that we can continue to do what we can for our patients. And I think there's a lot of health systems that came out of it with that same mindset. And so, yes, I think we will be better served because we've been through something so hard and now we know we can do it and we're still implementing things and doing things to keep us in that space. Well said, well said. Um, there's a comment here <clears throat> uh, uh, stated, so this presentation reminds me of storming, norming, forming, yeah. and performing. Yeah. Uh, just like we have disaster drills, we may benefit from crisis drills. Um, yeah. You, you yeah. seem like you're familiar with that. I, that's the first time I've heard about that. But so I, yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's so smart. Thank you for sharing that because now, you know, I'll take that back and, and we we should do that. I think you're exactly right. Because yeah. this isn't the last. This is just, you know, we this was something we'd never done before, but certainly won't be the last. Such a globalized world, I think these types of pandemics and global crises are going to be more common than uh, than they were before. Yeah. Well, we're nearing the end of our session time. Uh, is there any last comments or thoughts you want to leave us with? I just want to thank everyone for the work that you're doing in healthcare. It's certainly not been easy. It's it's taken every bit of grit, like I mentioned earlier, and strength and courage to be able to get through this, I think, personally, but also to lead through this. And as we come out of it and become better leaders for our teams, we need to talk and share with one another what we're doing so that we can become better together. And at the end of the day, all of us benefit from that across the country. Because if I'm a patient in a state outside of my own I want to know that wherever I am, I'm going to receive amazing and excellent care. And if we work together, we can actually achieve that for our country. Mm -hmm. Well said again. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for joining yeah. us and for sharing such incredible uh, successes from your hospital system. Um, I'll close this out and I'll, I'll give a little snapshot of tomorrow as well as a little summary of the day. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you incredible session i i'm gonna actually take a lot of those ideas and maybe see if we can be inspired by you uh for our own because we work a lot with with hospital systems as well but um wonderful presentation so thank you for joining us for our second day in Beto's healthcare live i'm your chairperson andy tilstra and i'm going to give us just a quick summary of the sessions that we've had today just to remind us of some of the great new learnings that we were shared with so the first session we had was from abdullah bird song Director, Business Modeling and Transformation at Novant Health. He stressed the importance of clear communication to the process of developing a business capability model. Now, he had troves and troves and troves of information of strategy and process that I think anyone would, would take notes and heaps of notes from. So please rewatch that recording. If not, rewatch all the recordings. Um, after that, you had uh, yours truly and my colleague Karen uh, presenting um, on how leaders can support innovation anywhere in the organization with four simple ways. And that is through the voice, 
through education, through accountability, and through resources. We think that leaders can be the amplification and the absolute catalyst for innovation at any organization, including hospitals. So there is a lot of stress there needed for leaders to give voice, education, accountability, and resources. After that, we had Swadeep Singh come and lay out the framework and the need for AI in healthcare when it comes to ethics, as well as uh, how to focus the AI with an intention to be as unbiased as possible. Swadeep had an interesting uh, theory of how to use AI in the future for pandemics and other global crises. And then finishing out today, which you just heard in this session was Lara Burnside. Lara uh, described and gave us great uh, content on how to care for our caregivers, especially in the face of such catastrophic events of COVID, um, positing that leaders need empathy, vulnerability, compassion, integrity, grit, flexibility, and love. I think that is that is so true, and I think if a leader can embody at least half of those, they're a great, successful leader. So tomorrow, uh, we have a great docket as well. Um, I believe we have two uh, uh, sessions scheduled for tomorrow, and that's starting with Dr. Pinky Dharm Shaktu, um, the Associate Director and Global Medical Excellence of Merck Group. Um, that was, they'll be starting us out, and they'll be giving us some great new, um, fascinating insight into how, how the global medical uh, market can be working and how we can learn more about that. After that will be Darty Tripathi, uh, Vice President, Chief Digital Transformation Officer of GE Healthcare. Well, that was day two of BTOS Healthcare Live. Thank you so much for joining us. I've been Andy Tilster, and it's been a pleasure and an honor. So excited to see you tomorrow. We'll see you at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you so much for joining us. Talk to you later.